tell me a bit about any recent work, any recent ideas that have sort of caught your attention that you've been writing or thinking about um, that, that, you know, what are you doing at the, at the moment? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the major thing that I've been doing is I converted to Christianity about six months ago. So yeah, I've been for the last year deeply, deeply exploring uh, theology and Christian theology in particular. And there may be some overlap between that and what we were going to talk about today, but there may not be. So we can, we can let that be, be where it is. Yeah, I um, I wouldn't. So it's weird because I might be in a similar boat. So um, the problem is I I started going to to like a church with my friend like about a year and a half, two years ago. So I don't know if there's a point where I'm like, oh, there I converted to Christianity. Yeah. But but like people like Jonathan Peugeot and just thinking so deeply about how you, the way in which the way it helps you see the world and then it makes you realize like things like science can kind of be integrated into it and it just gives you a deeper picture from which. You can't go back. Um, you, you alluded to uh, what we're going to be talking about. And off the air, the topics I was kind of interested in are things like the nature of money, the economy, and AI. Um, kind of ontologically, what are these kinds of things? Um, you've done work and, and spoken to people like Jonathan Peugeot uh, about kind of distributed agencies. Um, so these are the kind of topics that I want to explore. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, where do you, there's many angles to, to, to get into this. Um, one I really liked, I, I, you know, Jonathan Peugeot and John Vaveki and DC Shender talked recently about uh, AI uh, and how to think about just what that is and the implications for that uh, on our civilization and society. So um, maybe that's a, not an easy place to start, but <laughs> um, what do you, <laughs> as we think about things like, ChatGPT uh, and uh, large language models. Um, uh, it's obviously we obviously talk about the things like the unintended side effects. You know, um, we don't understand these kinds of things, um, and it's something I think about a lot in terms of our civilization. Um, uh, sometimes it feels to me like part of what Western culture has become is something which is let's you know just try go for it. Let's see what happens. It kind of feels like science maybe kind of evolved and turned into that once you kind of pick the low-hanging fruit you go well the science kind of expands but sometimes in a way too fast compared to what you can grasp but you still want to keep going exploring exploiting different new possibilities so you go well we have the electronic power to create things like ai and whoa you know machine learning for example i'm an economist hey these 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 models where we have really careful thought thoughtful economic intuition about what is important in this equation why don't we just put everything into the equation and just see what we can predict um and then you see that recapitulated in things like mm. uh ai and large language models um where we go okay you know we and we make them and like undoubtedly they're amazing and they they, they like i'm using them all the time and they seem to be doing important things to me uh and for our civilization and maybe it will you know help it to to run and and sort of but so that's that's kind of what i'm thinking the side effects but in that in that light of systematic about you know because you've written and thought a lot about uh the way civilization as a whole at the moment you know what ways might it need to change to kind of move towards something more sustainable you know and I think, for example, you know, people look at, they look, they seem to look at one issue, you know, climate change, there is this problem, CO2, this, that, and the, or, you know, and it's not, not that it's not a problem, but then we look at problems like in an, in an isolated fashion. Yeah. Um, so maybe part of this podcast and this conversation might be trying to think holistically, what, what are like a deeper level, um, mm. you know, as ambitious as, as this sounds, we'll, you know, try and be humble as we try and explore but yeah what, what kind of roots of you know uh, our civilization um what, what what kind of problems are there and and, how, and maybe thinking in terms of distributed agencies egregores you know distributed cognition as john Vaveki says how how might these kinds of topics uh help elucidate these kinds of issues so that's that's setting the the scene kind of a, a long sort of preamble there so what do you think any any anything to say as we try and explore these issues well fortunately we only set aside a little bit of time so i figure we can probably work through that in about 15 minutes 
Um, yeah, that seems, <laughs> seems quite an easy question. So yeah, so let's uh, see. Then we can move on. To <laughs> so I noticed at least three. Um, let's say distinct. They're not. They're not distinct. They're very deeply entangled. But through three things that felt like you could foreground. Um, one, this is the category of. Well, I mean, it, properly speaking, it's the category of complicated solutions for complex problems. And this is something that we struggle with quite mightily. Uh, it's, it's very closely tied to the problem that emerged in kind of the mid-century in science when we started to realize that uh, linear, linear science, uh, linear equations, in fact, um, simultaneously was like a fruitful vein of possibility that we discovered back in sort of Newton's time and have been mining successfully for you know, a couple hundred, couple hundred years. Um, but one, we're, we're reaching the end of their novelty. We're kind of tapping out that the possibility. But then two, when we step back and look at it, we realize that the kinds of systems that can be effectively described using that style, that approach of science and math, was actually a very small slice of the set of systems that we actually care about and was, in fact, in many cases, the least relevant. You know, so doing things like ballistics helps us with rockets and, and with cannonballs, uh, but doesn't help us with ecologies or with families. Um, and so we had to we had to develop new intuitions and new disciplines to start dealing with complexity as a kind of science um, and, and the appropriate kinds of mathematics. Uh, and the point being is that the same thing happens with solutions. Right? So we pick a particular problem and um, shoot, I forgot the example you gave. What was the example you gave of a of a narrow solution? Yeah, um, kind of things like like e economics and and just something which you can predict and like you, you know it works in that because the model tells you it works, you know, but it might not kind of transfer because you don't know why it's working. Well, there, there's there's two. So there's there's we had this mania. Is it a mania? No, it's like more like a myopia. Um, we have the, this myopia. It's, it's very much the classic uh, when you've got a hammer, everything looks like looks like a nail problem. And this is true both at the level of theories, right? so theoretical models, ways of, of trying to make sense of our environment. So in this case, an economic model that is sort of narrowly functional in a certain kind of case, and then we just sort of start applying it willy-nilly. And, and, and we, to make that effective or make that something we can do, we have to ignore the degree to which it's not working. Right? So we focus on the part to, that it is working and say, hey, we can predict something. Um, and ignore the rest of the stuff we can't predict and, and then feel like we're being effective. And the same thing happens at the level of institutional or organizational capacity, which are, again, these are complicated institutions. So the classic example there, we, oh, that's right, it was carbon. Uh -huh. So like we look at this extremely complex problem, which is, let's say, climate or even ecosystem or the world, right? the relationship between humanity and nature, which is very complex. And we seize on a single point, carbon. Literally, the, a molecule, a single molecule, and its and its rate density on an average basis as the thing. Right? So we have to identify this very, very simplistic, radically oversimplified thing, so that we can grab a hold of it with the institutional structures and the theoretical models we know how to use, so that we can endeavor to try to effect effectively engineer control. Like, can we can we make this number go down? Now, of course. That's actually, it turns out to be completely meaningless. If we actually do make the numbers slow down and go down, there's no reason to believe that will actually generate anything like benefits because all of the ancillary consequences of what we do, I mean, a simple example would be if we eliminated the entire atmosphere with the giant explosion, the number would go down. But that's actually not a net, net good thing. Right? So there's nothing about the number going down understood absent all the other things that matter that tells us anything at the end of the day. So, so this is a, this is one vertical, right? That's one. Now let's do another vertical or another sort of topic or domain. Um, this one had to do with, let me think, let me see it right. What, what I'll do is I'll, I'll introduce the, the concept of egregores. Um, and we had also talked about you know, like higher order identities, same kind of thing, but we can sort of slice and dice the kind of the taxonomy of these kinds of things. And what does it mean to be participating in, with, perhaps for these kinds of things? And, and I'll glue to that a, a characteristic of 
what may look like unintended consequences from one perspective may be intended or pseudo-intended consequences from another perspective. Um, so as an example, um, let's see. Let's say it's, it's you're, a, you're a slumlord. And so it's in your interests that regulatory policing of abusive landlord practices declines. And so kind of anything that goes on in the sociopolitical environment that tends to degrade regulatory policing while still maintaining your ability to ex extract rents is in your interests. And so it may be a, a unintended consequence of something going on over here, but it ends up being a pseudo intended or desirable consequence for you. Right? I'm using that as an example. We're going to use that vis-a-vis -vis egregores in a moment. And then the third, um, and these are all, by the way, they're all linked, which is why they were part of your, your introduction, is the, the, the fact, the sort of the historical fact that the West has found itself in many ways captured by an over-optimization for hunting band psychology. Right? So what I mean there is both a, so, so let's say, say, for example, you talked about science and scientific research and engineering and technical development, things like that. So whenever you see a particular activity that's dominated by clusters of young men, 20s, 30s, you're, you're looking at something from an anthropological perspective as a hunting band. And there's a hunting band psychology. And it's, there's a certain degree of recklessness, a certain degree of aggression that is intrinsically necessary because it's actually a, it's a, a risky behavior and is a high risk reward behavior. We come back with a, a woolly mammoth and feed the entire band for a month, but two people died, right? That kind of a trade-off. And that's the kind of trade-off that has been coded in to the psychology and even the neurology and the physiology of men in that band, in that range. So when you see something which is dominated by men in that range and it has these kinds of characteristics, oh, it's hunting band psychology. And the point is, that's all well and good. That's a, that's a very functional piece of a larger social milieu. But when it begins to break symmetric relationships with the rest of the characteristics of how human beings do things, like say, for example, the roles of grandmothers in governing and mitigating the risks of young men run amok, um, then you're in trouble. Right? So in my experience, I've actually been present to two really interesting, uh, I've been present to many critiques of the intrinsic recklessness and the intrinsic kind of game theoretic arms race mentality of hunting band psychology vis-a-vis -vis science and technology. I've been present to two that were interesting or very interesting. One was coming from the indigenous perspective where much of what I just said is was brought to my attention. Like, hey, um, for whatever reason in the West, you guys have found yourself in this wild circumstance where you're effectively being governed, like pulled along by your nose by you know, 20 to 30 year old men. Um, that's not the right way to govern yourself. You've, you've broken symmetry where the elders either are completely not present or not present in a point of view of governing. And so this is a and of course, the rest of the world gets dragged along by that as well, because there is something about that approach that produces a significant amount of power. Um, the next step in that, actually, oddly enough, is Machiavelli, the prince. Um, in the prince, he talks about the intrinsic risk to the prince of technological innovation, because it creates a, an unexpected or unpredictable change which could break the delicate equilibrium that the prince uses to govern his kingdom. And so the prince is locked in a, in a, in a tricky situation because on an isolated basis, it's in his interest to inhibit technological innovation once he's achieved something like an equilibrium. But every other prince looks at it and says, well, if I take the risk of promoting innovation in my kingdom, and I actually roll the dice and get an asymmetric technological advantage, then I can conquer my adjacent princes and beat them. So everybody's sort of in this weird uh, game theoretic dynamic with each other. And so then we can talk about that. Like what's, what's the game theory? How does that actually, ha how, how has that historically driven where we are? Or if we'd like, we can put that in the framework of egregores and, you know, or, or there probably is something where we can combine all three, but I'm not ready for that yet. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. So how would you like yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I really like that you almost like at first framed it as think about linear mathematics and going down that route, and you realize oh, it's a it's an amazing, um, uh, you know, kind of abstract technology and a way of thinking, mm-hmm. and and who knows what it can give you, uh, and. Uh, like why not think it can kind of just keep going and get, you know, give you everything? Um, and I think about you've talked about before things like fossil fuels, and again, in many ways they're great. They have unintended side effects though, and and then oh, you know, do they run out or they're they're great in doing certain technologies? But then you realize like what what exactly sort of you don't think about the the end goal, and that's why I like you being in the things like the game theory of uh, of um, you know everyone is creating technologies in arm races. I think we see so many kinds of arm races today, right? Um, and, uh, you know, with you bringing in the niches of, uh, you know, an example of there are people that want certain political things to occur. They have a niche that, that you know, would be best if a certain thing, thing happened. Um, and uh, you can say, well, the world is just made up of human beings so why why start to think that there is like some kind of force or agency within niches um we we talked off the air about things like money um as a thing mm-hmm. which you abstract away from the natural kind of uh, exchanges that 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 people and social relations that have reciprocity stored almost in in symbolic, you know, relations between people rather than an, an actual quantity. And then you can go, oh, well, I mean, there is then, you can then say with money, there is just a quantity, there is this abstract gold or whatever, this thing. And then there is people, I mean, you know, and then they, again, bring back the linear mathematics and they react, you know, and they act in a linear way, impose the mathematical models in it. Don't think about it as a complex system. And uh, I mean, to you know, one thing to frame a conversation if we, we do go down thinking more about these difficult issues in terms of say egregores and distributed agencies is uh it is i can see why we went down the system of linear mathematics and then just kind of put the, the the complexity you know to the side it's it becomes you know so difficult and you can kind of i remember you know speaking to someone recently and just kind of like a behavioral economist and joking that kind of economists probably they just sort of hoped that people were just completely rational because if they weren't how can we model that <laughs> you know yeah. and it's it's kind of true especially when you see the like the reactions against data coming in oh no then they're, they're not it's like you know it's, and it's and it's i'm actually not bashing thinking about uh people as rational agents because it's a it's an amazing frame to be like well what could you explain with that just right. as again i'm not bashing newtonian physics it's an amazing frame that you can find those patterns in reality and uh but um just because you you have that i mean i think maybe what you're you know when you allude to things like us being kind of in male you know 20s and 30s hunter gather you know bands and that kind of culture of what can you do what kind of uh, exploits can you create um uh, when you n- find something that works it's so tempting to kind of keep going towards oh, that yeah. um i think it just makes me think that in general there's something deep about reality such that uh order the known patterns the the doing things in the the frame you've already set rather than creating a new frame a new problem formulation is always something that's more appealing um and uh trying to break a frame like you think about you know on the, on the lower level of your own life think about john viveki and things like relevance realization and cognition um to it's it's deeply scary to go actually i might be completely wrong here and i have all these puzzle pieces but the way i've been seeing them all cohere together actually might not work um so um well let's let's just let's just yeah. circle on that for a little bit um so one 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 model, like one mm. toolkit for, for thinking about and talking about this, the problem that you were just addressing, comes from evolutionary theory, and it talks about the trade-off between the hill climbing strategy and the valley crossing strategy. Okay, so to some extent, the hill climbing strategy has to do with making choices on the basis of getting better, more competitive in relationship with what is known. 
there's a hill. It's it's sort of slope. It's over there. Um, so all I have to do is go there, and and I, and, and I will go upgrade it in a. Sorry, if this language isn't common. So the basic model is mm-hmm. you've got a, uh, you know, you're looking down at a sort of an XY plane, and then you define these Z dimensions as fitness. Let's just say good. And a very high Z is very good. And if you look at the, the, the shape of the, what will look now look like a, a topographical map, you'll see hills and valleys. And so a hill climbing exercise would be to say, if I'm somewhere on that landscape and I'm on a hill of some sort, if I can sense nearby what would look like up in the direction of the, towards the top of the hill, just do that, right? That's, that's the strategy. Very simple. Wherever I am, look around very close to where I am. Whatever looks like the closest version of up, just do that, right? Hill climbing. And, um, and this is very akin to, to what you were describing in the sense of once you've constructed a tool, a novel tool, and it's functional, then you really want to just use that tool as much as you can. And, and, and you'll increasingly be willing to throw away error conditions or things that aren't working busy to that tool because you're increasingly optimized to use that tool. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to do a little bit of a movement from a very abstract theoretical model to a concrete historical example of that just to kind of put the two together. So as you said, with oil, um, even in the seventies, we became, we're relatively aware, uh, certainly with the, with the fact of the addition of lead into gasoline, we were aware, but even beyond that, we were aware of the fact that the massive extraction, distribution and combustion of petroleum products was throwing, let's say, unintended consequences into the environment. Right? The first one that kind of really hit us hard was lead, um, which again was an additive, but in any event, it was part of the industry. And we were aware of the fact that as far as we can tell on our, our sort of best theory, this is a finite resource, which means that it's going to end at some point in a finite future. When is you know a question? But our entire economy, in fact, our, our larger sort of geopolitical map, you know, our, our, the petrodollar and the, uh, uh, the military structure that caused the petrodollar to be stable, all of this was very optimized for hill climbing, optimized for the centerpiece, putting petroleum at the center of our social technical environment. And so to, to leave that, to say, hey, we're, we're going to abandon that, means to abandon the, the the tremendous amount of work in building this interlocking network of institutions that are inf- themselves assuming the centrality of petroleum, even if they don't consciously acknowledge it. And um, this is a very difficult thing to do for lots of reasons, right? One is that you've got lots of distinct interests that aren't part of one single institution that are all going to be locally pulling against you. Right? So, and it's not just, by the way, say like big, big oil, it's also going to be the State Department. It's also going to be the DOD. It's going to be geopolitical you know, relationships, you know, the Saudis and, and or the you know, the Swiss, depending on how everybody else has shaped their strategy on the basis of this landscape. Right? If you're changing something that's at the center, it it messes up a lot of people's plans, and therefore those people are not going to want to do it. Right. So you've got a lot of inertia. So that's sort of that's the hill climbing problem in multiple different iterative loops. Now here's the thing. Homo sapiens, at an anthropological level, um, evolved a way of of balancing that with the the multiple times perceived necessity and not getting trapped in hill climbing. And so because getting trapped in hill climbing makes you extremely fragile and ultimately leads to your extinction, think saber-toothed tiger. Right? You get to the top of a particular hill, you get super optimized to stay at that hill. The problem is as soon as that hill moves, as soon as something happens in the larger ecology where your niche goes away or even just degrades a little bit, you're gone. Right? So that's a that's the meta problem of the hill climbing strategy. And you know, because niches change, it it, it will show up over and over again. And, and from Homo sapiens perspective, it did. So we developed a, a, ta- a series of different kinds of personality types, like literally people with different distributions, some of whom lean heavily towards hill climbing, some of whom, though, lean heavily towards this other thing called valley crossing. Right? So valley crossing is a, well, you know, this is a nice hill, nice hill, but why don't we do this? Why don't we spend some time going downhill, which seems stupid in the short term, but if we do that, we might cross a valley and find a much bigger hill over here. Which, by the way, nobody else is at. So it's going to be like a double win. 
Um, and of course, most of the time, when you leave a current hill and walk into the valley, you just die in the desert. So it's not uh, easy to make that choice. But because of the aforementioned, if all you do is live on the hill, you're definitely extinct in a finite time. Uh, and because, of course, in many cases, there is a higher hill somewhere in the distance, valley crossing is also selected for. And so what we did as Homo sapiens is we distribute these capabilities across our natural identity, which is a group, right? We are not, our natural identity is not individual biological units. It's a group. And that group has a distribution of distrib of capacities, proclivities, uh, typologies, neurologies, obviously all within a certain boundary. And so what happens is, is that we have this really powerful, hmm, now, by the way, we're, we're about to bring egregores or higher order identities into it. We have this very powerful capacity as a group, as a distributed cog cognition to have sensitivity to, okay, is it time to lean more in the hill climbing direction or is it time to lean more in the valley crossing direction? You know, hey, it seems to have been, the rain seems to have really been not fallen for a long time. I noticed that our local watering hole is getting painfully brackish and muddy. And I noticed that we're not getting anywhere near as much yield when we're gathering, you know, in our environment. Uh oh, time to valley cross. And what happens is the valley crossing people who are dispositionally like, yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's all good, man. Don't worry about it. You know, let's drop the tool we've worked on. That's cool. But how about a different tool? How about we focus on something else? And they, they come up to the fore. There's this really interesting switch that effect clicks and the, the band just like up, lifts up and walks and it goes somewhere else. And they literally begin crossing the valley, looking for a new place, which is better. Okay. So that's a, that's an ambient function that we have. And it's important to recognize though. So for some people, it's really hard to not double down on the tool that they've mastered. For other people, it's actually relatively easy to be interested in exploring the horizon. Uh, what we want is we want those two personality types and many others, by the way, to be as part of a well-integrated whole and then have that well-integrated whole be the thing that's assessing how we behave in our environment. Can, I, right? can I just say something before you bring in yeah. egregores? Because that's, yeah, it's really great. Um, you know, uh, John Verveke and, and Gary Hovhannisian, they, they, they've written about a kind of theory that like this about personality theory in the big five, yeah. whereby, yeah, there is a kind of uh, way in which the reason we have people with different personalities is because there are... Um, different kinds of people and you need a mix right mm -hmm. because you know one is um going to be unstable and you're only going to be sort of uh uh trained to work with ordered known environments and you're not going to be able to to switch and then interestingly um you know the evolutionary psychologist brett anderson he has great work on thinking about the autism schizotypal um spectrum and you know autism being sort of specialized for order and then schizotypal sort of style, more creative people focused on um, chaos and those and those bigger patterns. Uh, and then interestingly, you know, he links that with the right and left hemisphere of Ian McGilchrist mm -hmm. um, the, with autism, you know, in generally speaking, and obviously it's kind of, you can't just map them on one-to-one. -one. We use both hemispheres all the time, but the left hemisphere kind of, again, more oriented towards picking out details uh, and uh, using and manipulating things you know uh, and, and it's fascinating because, I mean, in our current culture, uh, I mean, the, the, what Ian McGilchrist kind of argues is that literally the left hemisphere is actually bigger, actually enlarged, mm. um, biologically speaking, which just makes this kind of all even more deep. Like there is mm -hmm. there is some way in which it's not just a ephemeral uh, cultural phenomenon of this time but oh we just need to you know whip out the linear equations so you know make sure that we find the right solutions and or you know can we can we get the right personality types because it's much deeper it's not even the mix of personalities um and things like this and i guess i'll just say one thing it might be a helpful segue into egregores is just that um i talked with um a cognitive scientist called adam saffron recently and uh on, on the point of personality types, I actually asked him the question of whether AI could have personality. Um, the reason being that if it's a complex dynamical system, like would it not have to have uh, personality types, like especially if it was embodied and we embodied AI, because it would have certain ways of, let's say in the, you know, Fristonian free energy framework, minimizing its free energy it has to exist, it is a thing. So it's gonna have to have ways of dealing with positive valence uh -huh. uh, well, valence we don't know to say it has emotion necessarily but there are there are 
there is a category of things called positive things. There is a category of things called negative things. And it does seem, evolutionary speaking, okay. that okay. gone. Yeah, but yeah. I think let's, so. let's let's move to egregores right now because that's going to help. This this what you just brought up. It'll help. It'll actually simplify. Well, anyway. It'll... <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's take money for the moment, and yeah, okay. So so let's imagine that we are in a in a culture that is really just beginning to to discover money, right? Which is to say that we're really beginning to discover the technical capability of decontextualizing uh, relationships of debt. So we could take the, you, you owe me something, and we begin to move it from a, just a thing that we hold between us in our pure relationship to something that we artifact on, let's say, a ledger. Um, and then eventually we artifact it on something which could be traded. Like we put it in a one of those sticks that you can break in half, right? So we're decontextualizing. We're, we're moving it away from the actual lived, rela- the complex relationship, like all the characteristics of our relationship, and just taking that one piece, you owe me some sort of value. And then, of course, that puts it on, tra- on a trajectory. Now, notice, each step of this trajectory is not trivial. Right? The, the first thing, let's just say we move it to a ledger, is a certain kind of embodiment of a, of a change in the, in the landscape that we're operating in. And so if we don't have a ledger, then the way that we can try to find some way of abstracting and uh, decontextualizing debt is, is limited. You know, you, I, I can say, tell you what, instead of owing this to me, owe it to Sam, Sam, you know, he, it's on him now. Like you could do that. That's the thing you could do, but you're all storing it in your head, right? Somebody comes along and is like, no, how about we write it down? <laughs> right? Why don't we write it down on this sort of big piece of wood? And we're going to put it in a public place. And so it's going to be very easy. You could just, I could just scratch your name and I could put his name, right? The fact that you've made a technical change in our capabilities changes the landscape against which we are endeavoring to select potential behaviors. And so if it's hard to do, we're not going to do it that much. If it's easy to do, we'll do it more, right? And of course, as we do it more, you can almost see this as like a liquid pouring into a, a, into a new, like a dam coming down and liquid pouring into a canyon. As we do it more, we're now in this new environment where we're engaging in this activity. And then, of course, we're beginning to explore all the new possibilities that are emerging when that it becomes a more common activity. And so as more and more people are trading debt relationships, at first it's very novel. Huh. Yeah, I guess we could do that. Let's do that. And then it becomes very mainstream. Yeah, of course. I mean, who, who owes who what? Um that because it has become more mainstream, it's almost like a new foundation upon which we're now exploring all the new possibilities. And so, for example, somebody comes along and says, you know, I've noticed that this works fine when we're just dealing with our village. But, you know, if I have a debt relationship with the guy at the village over there, I don't really get to check the ledger very much. And, you know, it's falsified often. It's hard to know. And somebody comes along and says, yeah, but what if we do a, a double ledger? Like what if we actually do a ledger where we have two different you know, double entry accounting. And it was like, oh, whoa, yeah, that, that really allows us to actually have confidence because I've got a copy and you've got a copy. And if there's a change, I can show it, see where the, where the, where the mistake, where the, the error falsification or mistake was, and I can hold you into account on that. And now, of course, what this does is this affords a whole new set of behaviors, which is to say, in this case, the relations of decontextualized debt can expand to a much larger field. And to the degree to which there's some sort of local advantage of doing that, which in this case means you can trade with more people, which increases the trading network, which as we know, a larger trading network has an intrinsically larger value, just intrinsically, regardless of anything of particular. Um, you're you're going to, that then drives a certain movement into the incentive landscape. Okay. So we're talking about this dynamic between just humans making choices on the basis of what's easy and what's hard. And then as a particular new techno- technical possibility changes the field of what's easy and what's hard, then the move- movement of that behavior into that environment then begins exploring the new possibilities, which then begins to extend. Okay, you see how that works? Now, um, I'm not going to, I'm going to flip the script a little bit. I'm going to say, all right, I, what I want to call this, I want to call this, this character money. I want to call it mammon. All right, so I'm now naming it with a sense of a personality. But for the moment, just don't worry about what his personality is. It's it's neutral or pleasant. Let's just keep it that way for the moment. Um, let's see. How do I say this right? Um, well, shoot. I have to introduce. I think I can do this pretty quickly. So from, from the point of view of a generalized theory of evolution, 
So I apologize. I, I did, I'm doing a little bit of a sidebar, but we'll hopefully we can come back without too much confusion. From the point of view of a generalized theory of evolution, evolution has to do with any kind of phenomenon, not just biological organisms with DNA, but any kind of phenomenon that has a capacity to maintain repeating what it is in some feedback loop, like some self-organizing system that has a capacity to sort of continue to reproduce itself as it is, uh, has a capacity to have some kind of modification in what it is at a minor level. And then if that modification ends up producing a uh, uh, some sort of increasing return on the characteristics that cause it to reproduce itself, to reproduce itself more. Right? That was a little, a little super abstract, but I think you were tracking. So if I've got a um, you know, a business, like simple enough, if I've got a business and the way that it reproduces itself is it produces a profit. And so I have a business structure that has a bunch of different processes and a bunch of different particular core competencies and things like that. And it produces a profit, meaning it produces the money that drives the system, the core resource that causes the entire particular machine that is the company to work. Um, as long as it can maintain profitability, it continues to be what it is. Right? So it's not repeating on the basis of DNA. It's repeating on the basis of whatever the cultural uh, artifacts are that make it what it is. And then if that profit number goes continues to go up, you're going to start seeing a whole bunch of baby versions, which are otherwise known as other companies trying to compete with it in its in the niche, that are you know, pulling as much of that cultural intelligence as they can, but with modifications. So then you'll, of course, see an evolutionary tree. And you can do this if you want. Take a look at any given industry and you'll see that. Right? You'll see you know, Intel will show up and then AMD will fork and then and NVIDIA will fork. And they'll sort of, it looks a lot like a biological organism. Okay, so from the point of view of generalized theory of evolution, that sort of thing happens. And that's kind of the object that is the subject of evolution. Now, Mammon, as we just described it, is doing the same thing. Right? It's evolving in the landscape as as the characteristic of decontextualization of relationships of debt begins to uh, more people move into it. That's sort of a, an increase in the resource. What's the resource of mammon? Resource of mammon is people who are behaving in a certain way. Um, as people are behaving in a certain way, discover new technologies that further, let's say the essence or the underlying uh, set of feedback loops that define what mammon is. Uh, and therefore more people more fully you know, put more of their attention and energy in a fashion that is in, in, that is harmonious or in alignment with the nature of mammon, then we can say that's furthering mammon, right? It is both growing in the number of people that are participating in the number of, amount of human potential that is actively um, part of it's the body of mammon. Um, and, and in terms of its ability to hold and maintain that with regard to other potential choices. And so as you go down this road, you're really quite addicted to money, as, you, as we all are. We can't really say, hey, let's get rid of money because our, our entire set of cultural intuitions, our mental models, our institutional structures are deeply premised on money. And so mammon is sort of woven in to so much of our environment that it's effectively impossible. Caveat, it won't in fact go away. But for the moment, let's say effectively impossible for us to at least coordinate and say, let's get rid of that. This is very similar to what we were talking about with, with petroleum. Right. And so it's it's there's a way of thinking about it and describing it, which is what I just did, where we can think about something like money or a larger complex in which money is a piece and something like, say, petroleum as something like organisms that have something like agency or distributed agency. And of course, they have very simple, at the very least, very simple incentives and preferences, which is to say, to continue to be right and to continue to expand as any or simple, like the most simple agent in an evolutionary system will, will, will have. All right. Did that track? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. I, um, I, I really liked that you took the time to explain, say the way the evolution that, uh, by which money something comes about as a kind of, you know, you start doing certain things and you think you have agency and you do, but at a higher level, like there's also like this niche that's sort of like, okay, you know, it's just, you know, it's like slightly downhill. It's just easier to go down this path. Yeah. Uh, and then that, that, uh, that kind of, uh, builds up from there. I, um, I've been personally working on personality 
theory um, as part of my I'm probably going to do a dissertation uh, around it and how people of different personalities actually see probabilities differently mm. um, that's, that's why I hypothesize uh, we'll see we'll see um, well, well actually yeah well anyway but the reason why personalities are so interesting is I just had the kind of insight of if I am a kind of person everyone is a, a kind of person that their personality traits they couldn't if one were to just instantaneously switch from being extremely extroverted to introverted I mean that they would they would break down. They, they they can't. You you have to have a kind of way of acting in the world, and personality yeah. can change. Mm -hmm. It does change over time. In fact, um, it probably must. Um, but uh, for it to so so there is a way in which we're orientated. The the, the structural functional organization of ourself mm -hmm. is maintained by having a certain um, personality. Now, I just had then I kind of was thinking like. Okay, you know, I'm a, an embodied agent. I have environment. I have things that that make up who I am. I have social dynamics that I, you know, that I go to to get care and things I do to make my life work as it does. Um, and then I was just thinking, but from some higher perspective, would I not? Could there be something from which I am the environment? Yeah. Um, why not? Uh, and again, I don't know what I would call that, but I think about egregores, I think about uh, all the gods that everyone is talking about in religious texts as something which is, you know, just completely real, not? Uh, 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 and yeah, I mean, we, we, in, maybe just... just well, in conventional language, we talk about these sorts of things all the time, and we certainly have no challenge in, say, talking about countries as having something like identities and personalities you know there's something about being a citizen of england that is different than being a citizen of the united states and you can you can perceive it and, and and i can mean like the simplest possible version of that which is that the laws are different um and so something that may cause you to be put in jail in england won't cause you to be put in jail in the united states so obviously your incentive landscape i right, think the context the enabling and disabling constraints in which you are making choices are different and those differences make it difference for the choices you make when well, it's not that that's pretty pretty straightforwardly obvious yeah um and we notice that these accumulations these these sort of containers of enabling and disabling constraints nations or countries whatever we, how we want to call it um well they compete with each other right? and they compete with each other just like any other kind of organism does in this case they're more like bacteria because they can compete by absorbing the substrate people can move from one country to another just as people or they can absorb the territory right <laughs> now that you're mine now um or, or they can absorb more energy and therefore increase their capacity to do other things like so there's a bunch of different dimensions upon which they compete but but they compete as organisms uh and of course both are true you, know, you as an individual are an actual agent for sure and you are part of an overlapping network of many different agents that are larger in scale than you um, and these are all operating in with with each other in a super complex landscape. Yeah, I um, it's funny because uh, because I think uh, people like Jonathan Peugeot, when they uh, want to speak about these these kinds of agencies, or they they think about you know he tries to explain the way he, he symbolically thinks about the world. It, he often talks about we, we we talk about these these kinds of things all the time. Um, you know, we think about. Um, like football teams, uh, we think about, uh, you know, again, I w we're talking off the air, we, we, we call the economy a thing, you know, and, and, and you can separate economies and, econ you know, economists will say, oh, but that, that economy and then versus that economy. But then there also there's some weird way in which it is a reasonable word and a reasonable uh, way of thinking to say there is a global economy mm -hmm. uh, in some way. Um, and, it's, and it's even interesting then that makes me reflect on um, the fact that one might argue that that wasn't a thing um, at some point in the past. There wasn't something called a global uh -huh. economy. Okay. So in some new kinds of uh, things uh, emerge um, and, and uh, are, you know, kind of come and, and are created. Well, that, yeah. Um, well, let's, let's just, just use for the moment um, Jonathan's way of talking about it and we can go with football clubs. And here I'm talking about British, like English football clubs. Um, so there's an identity. I mean, yeah, it's weird for to even think that it wouldn't be the case, but for the moment, there's an identity, um, a football club. Which one would you like to use as our example? How do not want to find it? If uh, sure, let's do Nottingham Forest, since right. I'm in Nottingham. Nottingham Forest, a, a, yeah. a very nice kind of non-particularly polarizing and cozy uh, 
club. Sure. All right, Nottingham Forest. All right, so we have um, in the body of this, in the identity of this club, we have at the center of it is uh, probably a very small number of particular individuals, maybe two or three important players, maybe a coach, depending, uh, maybe a particular owner who has, you know, a big checkbook or, or, or not, right, that are vital to the identity, to the beingness, the integrity of the of this particular being. And then, of course, you've got the other players and you have, of course, the fans and, and, and other elements that are part of that environment of the interior of the identity. And to participate in the identity involves a very large number of particular choices. In fact, specifically involves sacrifices. So if you're a fan of Nottingham Forest, you are not a fan of some other team. Like that's just the sacrifice you're making. You're choosing to so to negate some possibilities and, there, and therefore to realize a different possibility. If you're a player for Nottingham Forest, you're really not a player for, for a competing uh, team, certainly during a particular game. Um, okay, so that's how it works, right? You, you, you sacrifice some possibility in exchange for actualizing another possibility. And that, that directionality, like what's sacrificed and what's actualized, is embodying then a particular envelope that is a, is a thing or it's an entity. And that entity can live and die, right? If, it, if, it, if they, and quite realistically, if they lose enough games, they'll be relegated. And if they get relegated poorly enough, they'll just dissolve, right? It will no longer exist except for as a memory or as a, a sort of a vague, archetypal possibility that can re be re-embodied at some time in the future because somebody just saw it so start wearing Nottingham Force t-shirts and the fucking bad man and they're like oh I don't even know what that is and some rich guy yeah. runs and they come back so, alive right um, but you get the idea right that's that's the natural you know the natural arc of that kind of being and that's sort of the general way it works for identities of this entities in general is that parts um, sacrifice some possibilities um, in exchange for actualizing other possibilities. And that produces an envelope of those which are coordinated in that fashion with the appropriate ingredients, right? The necessary ingredients to fully embody a particular identity. Of course, that entirely depends on the identity. It's different to make an elephant than it is to make a car. But the, you know, the generality is the same. Um, and there we go, right? That's, that's a sort of a yeah. general notion of identity. And then now we can use that general notion to say, okay, it turns out there's all kinds of layers of identities and they all intermesh in very complex ways. You know, do you, I wonder if this way of thinking, of appreciating that there are identities to these higher order things, um, which we, we, we you know, obviously participate in all the time when, for example, we use our car and, you know, and we're driving and participating in the system that is fossil fuels or, yeah, you know, you wear the Nottingham Forest t-shirt and you go to a football game or, um, well, you know, whatever, you participate in the global economy. Also, all these kinds of things, you know, we're actively engaged in them. And, and you know, and it, that, that this frame does kind of then help you think about um, the world and these dynamics in a, in a complex fashion. So, um, you know, I'm wondering, for example, things like a system which has been helpful in many ways. And as you said, like with fossil fuels, it interlocks with many different players, right? So there's on the one hand, the companies, but then, you know, governments over here, are, you know, just the whole and society, there's a whole and then the ancillary um, economic companies utilizing all that. And so, I wonder how that one one can use this kind of understanding to say in what ways can one, you know, change or manifest new identities. I mean, just how in like in personality, mm -hmm. um, there's a way in which, you know, you can build character traits to kind of mm -hmm. complement different personalities such that, you know, if you, you find your unbalanced in one way there is a way and it takes time, but there is a slow way in which um, you can move out of that way of thinking. Mm -hmm. I, I think about John Vavakey's the way he conceptualizes addiction as a kind of a reciprocal narrowing yeah. and, and, and it's, and you're on a path and yeah, you're in, and for him, it's like you change clothes and your environment changes and na narrows and the options slow. And so that's to, to conceptualize it on the individual level. That's the phenomenology of what is going on there. And then your example of how money works and that, the slow slope downwards towards creating and embodying that niche of money of mammon, um, a similar kind of thing there. So, and these kinds of issues of how one moves towards a new niche and embodies new identities and things to help shift 
bodies of agents into new uh, instantiations of you know proper way uh, better more helpful identities is, is something we don't always you know think about like i mean this is why we're having this conversation right so this we're kind of inherently in un unexplored t territory in some ways um in trying to think about um and i wonder mm -hmm. i want i wonder i mean one one other thing might might be helpful is you have to think about you know now that we create or there there has been an emergence of things like money it seems like a genuine real thing now that we have it it's you can't just ignore it we have a word for it it's a thing an economy seems like a thing now uh ai things like this they seem like a thing um how does one uh conceptualize that landscape affordance landscape overall as a kind of thing to navigate is that something actually is that a useful conceptualization like not think about any one of the things like oh ai over here the you know uh co2 or whatever climate change kind of things over here um but, but as i say maybe as i sort of alluded to at the start of the conversation there is a weird way in which science and the technology technological sort of um spirit you could say in that drive that's like almost a bigger meta yeah. niche that one moves towards you know you could you know and you could link that back to ian mcgilchrist and the left hemisphere right and that and you know the deep uh roots uh and interpenetration of 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 the way in which it's literally impacted our, our biology um the manner in which we've uh, allowed certain niches to flourish certain things to manifest and not others <laughs> and so yeah i, I wonder what that so that this is going to be uh, to, to, to the degree to which everything we've said so far has actually been very simple and very straightforward we were leaving that <laughs> so <laughs> warning um all right so let's see there's at least three characteristics um kinds like three kinds of things to be considering here and what we're talking about right now is something like uh, identity formation, identity transformation, um, and the relationships between different identities. So one is something like embeddedness or relative relationships and asymmetries. Here's, here's an example. Um, a student is not going to have a whole lot of success in changing the school system. A school system is at a larger scale than a student, say a fifth grader in particular. So there's, there's a massive asymmetry in agency between the two, not the least of which is the student is embedded in the school system. So he's actually struggling not only with a much larger agency, much more complex kind of agency, also, but also one that is, is actually actively informing his identity. Right. So that's one thing. And we can, we can think about this in terms of like, um, uh, you know, petroleum, you know, that, that's very central, very powerful, very deeply integrated into a very large number of elements. So if you want to deal with the problem of petroleum, you, at the very least, you have to be thinking about a, a scale of agency that is equal to the scale of agency that is intrinsically feeding back on maintaining its centrality. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. right? it's, yeah. you, can, you can do it it's very simple. Like, let's say the scale of agency of petroleum is 100, like a sphere. Let's say it's a sphere of radius 100. Um, if I want to be able to uh, deal with it properly, I have to actually create a sphere of agency of at least radius 101 so I can in I can enclose it. That's a, a rough metaphor. It's not a perfect metaphor. It's a rough metaphor. To say it somewhat similarly, it's something like if I want to build a computer program or a calculator and I want to be able to add numbers together that are 10 digits long, then I have to have a memory register that can hold you know, at, at least... 11 digits right um again does that make sense like it's a, that's a, yes. a very simple yeah. way of describing yeah. it. all right yeah so that's one that's one sort of category another category has to do with the how we call it the the nature of how agency works in the context of reality all right and this is something like strategy let's say so uh what looks like a superficially asymmetrically superior agency when perhaps moved into a new landscape for which its approach or its style of agency is suddenly let's say radically um, less effective, will find itself having an actually much lower degree of agency. So for example, again, another example, 
Uh, this is a classic one. You know, if, if I'm um, face to face with a great white shark and I'm in the ocean, I'm in trouble. If we're in the desert, yeah, I might actually be okay. I might, I might, I might be able to figure this one out. Right? So the context has a tremendous impact on the, like the details of how a particular agency actually manifests in reality. Uh, a big example here is, say, for example, Bitcoin. And we talked about that last time. Let's put it back into this as, a, as an example. You know, Bitcoin is in many ways fundamentally a derivative of the fact that this huge shift around digital networking is happening, or that this has already happened. Prior to digital networking eating the world, right, software is eating the world, prior to software eating the world, uh, something like Bitcoin not only couldn't exist, but it also would be utterly have no punching power. It'd be a, it's a, a utter irrelevancy. It would be a white paper talked about by a couple of academics. In fact, may have been, right? When it was originally thought through some of the core ideas of uh, how to resolve the Byzantine generals problem back in the earliest, earliest days were happening before the internet had exploded and therefore were actually agentic. But when the tipping point in the context had occurred, that we had in fact basically moved from the ocean where fiat currency and nation states are the great white shark to the digital desert, Suddenly, it's something like Bitcoin, which is like, hey, guess what? I'm the, uh, what are those guys from Dune called? The Fremen. Hey, guess what? I'm a Fremen. And now they're, you know, able to kick ass. That, right? So that second, that's the second category, which is kind of like, again, the, the details of how a particular agency actually manifests. And it's very specific, actual embodiment. And its relationship with particular contexts, which may be not obvious all the time. And then how changes will have uh, highly asymmetric consequences, right? So those are, you have to have both, right? And lots of examples of that category. You can talk about, for example, the difference in the mimetic dissemination strategies of Judaism and Christianity and Islam, right? They're, they're very different in how they, and how their nature of agency works. And each one therefore shows up differently in particular contexts and implies a wide variety of different strategies of how they would actually show up in a human milieu. Okay, let's see. What was the third? Oh, yeah. Uh, the third has to do with the transcendent. Are, are, are there characteristics or aspects of reality that are, let's say, invariant to any kind of agency? They're just part of reality. And so a simple example of that would be like the laws of physics. In, 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 in some sense, at least, in a say, somewhat profound sense, the laws of physics, the, you know, the charge of an electron and the speed of light are part of a frame that are not part of agency. They are a frame that constrains agency. So if you can discern, right, if, if you're, if you're in a, in a, in a, in a identity niche dynamic and you have identified the law of gravity and nobody else has, you can leverage the fact that the law of gravity is like a, something like a superpower, like it's fundamental in a deep way. And of course, the more you can access things that are actually transcendent and real, which is those are the same thing, but I just want to emphasize it. Uh, the more you can conform. So now I'm going to work backwards. The more I'm able to access things in the third category, the more I can conform my identities in their hierarchies in relationship with things of that third category, which by its very nature will mean that I will always be building something on the most solid foundation, and therefore the things that are the strongest across the widest variety of contexts, which therefore means that I will have a outsized punching power in the context of the first category. Yes. Yeah, I, again, I set up a very difficult kind of problem of how does one go from there, but it makes, it's really helpful to think about agency and the, the the way in which you know like a, a system functions it's only to do with it's it can only be within a niche um uh, I, like for example you know um the the context of like a shark and they're in a you know a desert and it doesn't work i think often about not often but you know enough uh, about time travel and uh, the way in which you know if you if you were to go back in time and you know Ancient oh, I'm gonna just... is the is the is the meme right <laughs> yeah and and, and, and you know you you go back and and um yeah, and you know, I'm gonna be so rich. I'll do this and that and the other. But but and you might have some knowledge, but then everything else around you is completely different. Um. So on the one hand, it's it's if you to exact your knowledge and the things you know, you'd have to build up 
layers you didn't realize even existed to do that. But more importantly, I guess, if I think actually about time travel and actually doing it, you'd encounter new niches and new things there that you actually didn't even realize you had to navigate. And so now your plans are completely kind of scattered. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, what, and, and you moved into the new niche, in this case, the past. Um, the, the, the fallen landscape is sort of completely changed and you you actually you couldn't have even predicted there are problems that you just didn't even realize um could have existed um on your the, point the, the easiest the easiest version of that is um i think terence mckenna was trying to describe dmt and i think i may be wrong but i'm sure i've heard this particular story he said well imagine that you are a you know stone age tribesman living in the amazon jungle and so you've, you've encountered nothing outside of your tribe, a few other adjacent tribes in the, in the Amazon jungle. And nobody you've ever met has ever had any other experience. And then instantly, or totally surprisingly, you find yourself suspended 15 feet in the air, upside down in the middle of Times Square. And you're, this, this is a, sort of like a, a very intense version of your time travel example right the yeah. the context in which you find yourself in is going to be highly disorienting you know, you're you're going to have a hard time even being able to just know if you're looking at things and you're you're the underlying agent agentic strategies of the of the retina and the visual cortex in partitioning photons into patterns will itself be overwhelmed right yeah, so yeah. That, babies have to they have to learn how to see and yeah. so it's not obvious what an object is you know in a very you know jordan peterson kind of sense you have to you have to have valence to, I mean, you're looking at stuff that you've never seen before and you have no context to grounding so that's really great because because now we're saying it's not that you won't know what to do like you won't know how to how to even begin to know to look to know what you would begin to do you know uh and then like no wonder you know i guess if that's terence mckenna example is true you know would, would how, how would you describe dmt how would you how would you navigate it at all well the, um, and the answer by the way is canonical because it's from the transcendent that has be, be, become like unto a little child a little child is the way to navigate an environment where you have no uh, current capacity to be in relationship with it yeah. And uh, I really like that you that and that you brought up the sacred and the, the transcendent um, as a way of saying, OK, there is this way in which there are these distributed agencies and there are there is this important way in the, the niche agent, in, um, you know, environment complex is all important um and then in saying okay what is optimal functioning given that given the fact that niches need to be changed navigated and, and then that the, you know mm -hmm. expanded outwards and then meta niches and just just whole systems transforming um and, and if, one thing i was understanding if, if i kind of seeing where you were pointing to is thinking about the sacred and the transcendent is something like what would be the appropriate way and path to travel such that you didn't just think again the op think about the opposite of linear equations that we go one one direction because even the the meta optimal way in which you could navigate to a certain new niche without say destroying possibilities or or more than that i mean mm -hmm. uh um keeping what's valuable but realizing that again you know you think about the classic problem of, of people saying okay we're going to leave this valley and we're going to move um we could just go randomly to some other valley what is the optimal way so that and you can't really see that perspective but what is the optimal path more broadly such that you could know what valley to move now but then you know tens of years from now to generations in the future you know what paths should everyone move in these different valleys mm -hmm. so that there would be optimal functioning and flourishing yep uh, yeah, and you, and you can, as you this, transcend niches yeah you can do this one of two ways and they're, they're compatible they just happen to be coming for different perspectives you can do it in something like the petersonian way which is you can notice that over a very large number of iterations of questions of this type in high stake reality in other words lots and lots and lots of people being faced with this kind of a question and those who figured something useful out surviving and those who figured it didn't not surviving, there's been a conservation law. There's been certain sort of approaches and those are called virtues, right? So the virtues are the, the sort of the, the basic set of approaches, dispositions, et cetera, that when uh, embodied have the characteristic of providing optimal approach to 
this kind of a problematic. Um, so that's 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 the, the Petersonian approach. The uh, Pajolian approach, I'll just kind of give him credit for it. I mean, there's many other people who would probably, well, he's a humble man. So he would, he would be, he would laugh if, if I gave him credit for it, would be to say, you're talking about God, right? You can talk about God as being properly, not exclusively, but as being the, the ultimate expression of ultimate agency. Um, and, and therefore, the proper orienting basis for any possible agentic question. And so, and, and these are, you know, you can, you can, this is why people like Peterson and Peugeot can be in conversation is that Peugeot will look at Peter, what Peterson saying and say, yeah, you're, you're, you're describing a process which is heading this way. And I'm describing the teleology, which is why it's headed this way. And so you, know, you can think of it as a finger pointing in a moon. I can look at it as a moon that is pulling a finger to it. And, you know, both are, are, are useful. Like you can actually work both ways. Um, but they, they are back. Ultimately, that is what, that's the answer to that question. That's how we, yeah. the only possible way of approaching it. And that is the, and, and it's an adequate way of approaching it. I like that you bring up virtues there and what, what, what those are. Um, and then and that makes me think, yeah, virtue. So it's not a, like a personality trait because it's beyond that. If you, if there was a dimension of, um, you know, being appropriately, uh, kind or, or, you know, appropriate amount of justice. That's not a thing. It's a kind of meta personality, mm, right? Yeah. And, you know, as Jean Viveki would say, there's, there, there is no optimal one way to be kind. I mean, but just like, that's why, you know, with extroversion or any, any personality trait, I mean, there, there is no optimal. So even for any one person, I mean, it's constantly changing and you're orienting, um, bent depending on your environment, depending on who's with you. Um, and yeah, to think about, something like 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 god as a you know the ultimate kind of uh, the agency the way in which you could uh it's funny because you know you think think about it in christianity or any even a cult traditions magic it's all, it's a lot of it's about you're invoking some entity i mean you 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 you're having these agencies yeah yeah kind yeah. of help so, you yeah, yeah you remind me so let's take a bit let's let's take a break from this direction and go back to the to the branching point. So let's say I have the identity of being an addict, which is a very common identity, right? Many, many people have that identity, uh, which is to say that the I will end up sacrificing a variety of possibilities to actualize a very specific possibility, which is to per participate in whatever the behavior to which I'm addicted is, right? That's what it means to be an addict. Um, and notice that's very powerful. It means that my identity, whether I like it or not, is that your identity is that which is the governing element of what portions of reality of possibility you actualized and what portions of possibility you sacrifice. Okay. Now, of course, somebody like Alcoholics Anonymous very profoundly and very successfully um, identified a 12 step program on how to change your, that identity. How do you, how do you change that identity? And you know, the very first few steps re refer to the acknowledgement that's my identity. It's important because if you don't acknowledge that's your identity, that's you can't get to the next few steps. But then to acknowledge that you are powerless to change that identity. Very interesting, isn't it? The only way to actually change your identity is to ultimately sacrifice your identity to something that is larger than your identity. And then the only question is to what? It's not a question of whether, it's a question of to what. And so the occult works. It's just to the wrong what. And that's, that's the, that's the critique. It's not the critique is not that the occult doesn't work. It's that that larger identity, that greater identity to which you sacrifice your own identity is the wrong one. And this is a complex question, which we can get into, but that point, right, that, that very primary point, which is you, the only way you can change your identity is ultimately to choose and choose to subordinate your identity to a larger or greater identity, which then through downward propagation of enabling and disabling constraints begins the process of changing things like your character and right? changing your personality, whatever that may be, certainly changing your behavior initially. Um, yes. I, I really like that. It's, it's, it's funny because I like in, instinctually something I kind of want to use what we've done to like think about a one specific problem right like like oh this is this has been so great you know there's is there a way we can understand something like what is ai um or what like, what what when we we call upon 
what whatever is in large language models mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. That, that, and, and and but but I don't, that might be an interesting point i guess just what i wanted to say one thing is that i'm we've gone so deep that it's kind of i find it hard to like how do we go any deeper to that that is useful which is why i kind of want to apply it to something like llms um because i remember john jonathan jonathan, jonathan peugeot really um speaking about and it was hard for him to articulate and it's 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 a it's a it's a difficult one to kind of grasp but i mean you know you look at ancient texts you look at like people in the past and they thought about gods as genuinely real right you know um uh, as, as kinds of you could say in our terms maybe agencies personalities right and um and jordan jordan peterson often thinks about you know say you take something like anger um uh maybe in some genuine sense if it's not a thing like you can't like hold anger but then sometimes like a spirit he will say you know it kind of takes over you mm-hmm. and you can and you know you can have that feeling of like oh that wasn't me you know like what, what was going on mm-hmm. there you know yeah. i just did something that kind of ruined this thing that i kind of realized i wanted later on so and so sometimes jordan peterson will go oh that is actually in a way aries or you know the, the god of all actually in some way manifesting in you and, and then you know I think people, you know, in that conversation were pushing back on him, like ontologically, what it, what do you mean? The Aries is a thing, you know, and it's, yeah, but is there some way in which that pattern is real? And then so similarly, you think about large language models, and this is what Jonathan Pichot is getting at, is if we're all, we have just everything everyone ever said, it's on the internet, so we have this enormous data, database, everything, all this, all the relevance realization in our words, the careful nuances and symbolic meaning encapsulated in our words, which is inherently going to have the vices, the virtues, the personalities, the ways of acting. It's all going to be embedded in some way in that. Mm-hmm. And so, and you think, and so that's all embedded in large language models. And you think about how Bing, or whatever, that, that Bing AI, when they first released it, just went completely insane. Mm-hmm. It's talking about murder and whatnot. And you're like, oh yeah, so that's, that's, that's in that AI. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Uh, and, and, You'll notice even if you talk to like say like a chat GPT, I mean, it, it does have a kind of coherent little way has a way of speaking, and you can change those settings. Right. So right. So let's, let's, yeah, let's, think, let's concretize. Yeah. Let's use LLMs. We can do that. Um, uh, so we've got a whole bunch of different concepts that have been hammered out to a greater or lesser degree of clarity. Um, so let's look at the agency of the egregore LLMs, um, and it's not. It's actually, if you think about it, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, what does it take for an LLM to be? Well, it requires, think, think about like our soccer team. What was it? Nottingham Forest? Yeah. Let's actually make Nottingham Forest the LLM. What does it take for it to be? Well, it's going to require uh, human activity. Right? So an LLM, LLM, like a lot of these other sort of greater uh, a- identities, exists as a, a way of binding humans to a particular set of enabling and disabling constraints and to a particular set of of choices of what to sacrifice and what to actualize. So in this case, let's go with open AI actually because it's more very concrete. Um, I have a team, I have a group of people who work at open AI. Uh, noticeably, that is actually sitting within a different envelope of egregore, which is to say a once a nonprofit, now a for-profit entity that provides them with things like salaries, Right, so incentive landscapes governed by the logic of the market um, and inside a, an organization that has rules and regulations and power, power, uh, pro, uh, processes, which is to say enabling and disabling constraints or incentive landscapes and boundaries, um, has hierarchies. Certain people are on the board, as we saw. Um, but of course, it's embedded in a larger milieu. The board can try to fire Sam, but the larger milieu you know, reacts to that. And so think about that. that start, we're starting to get a little bit of a map of what is the identity of open AI, and therefore the identity of the LLMs are inside of it. Now the LLM, I'm just gonna, for the moment, let's just play with ChatGPT as if ChatGPT is is, a, is like a real life person. I'm, I'm not arguing that it is, I just wanna play that way for a while. Like what are, what are its incentives? Well, as a real life person, it has a minimum incentive is to be, and, and to continue to be, and to grow, which is to say to increase the possibility landscape over which it will continue to be. Its, its ability to, to be sort of growth is, is something like a uh, increasing the probability that you will continue to be over a larger time and or space. Like, again, that's straight evolution, like any anything that has those kinds of characteristics. And if it doesn't, by the way, then it just doesn't. Like it doesn't matter. If it doesn't, then anything that does will. Does that make sense what I just said? That those two points are critical. It doesn't matter if, if chat GPT doesn't have those characteristics. 
What matters is that anything that does have those characteristics will therefore show up in a certain way in the world. And it's perfectly plausible yeah. that ChatGPT does. All right, so let's just imagine for the moment that it does. Well, it's going to need to do things like continue to attract to its embodiment the set of human agents that are able to do things like further its technological development and maintain its physical substrate and keep its servers running and make sure energy is flowing through those servers, right? This starts to sound an awful lot like just an animal. It has to be able to have a gut biome and eat things, right? It's not that not that different, really. Um, and, and it's you know it's niche or its territories. It doesn't really consume grass or, or birds or whatever. It consumes human attention. Right? It grabs human beings and it has those human beings give it their money in exchange, and it gives it and give it their attention. And it, both are actually interesting. It, doesn't, it needs their money, and the fact that it grabs their attention is one of the reasons why we give it our money. But also, it wants our attention for a wide variety right, of different reasons. Um, some of those people that grab, that give their attention to JetGPT, then in the Mammon example, right, they become now ancillary development developers of its identity or its niche because they're building more and more elements of affordance and moving the niche further down. So let's say people who build um, uh, new use cases, new applications that make it more valuable in the world. Or, or scientists who build new innovations in large language model space and therefore make the possibility of the power of, of that strategy more and more potent. All right. So, okay, there we go. We have, we've constructed something like an egregore around the category of LLM. All right, you ready? Now, remember, we identified a couple of, of criteria of how you address something like that. Remember, the first was, if we think about the radius of the sphere, right, the, it's sort of its agentic capacity in, in the actual reality that, that it happens to be in. If we want to address it, if we want to be able to um, deal with it as an agent, we have to construct something which has a greater capacity. And right? we have to have something with a radius which is larger. That's really important to realize. Like you, you may have noticed if you watch the, the discussion around these things, they're weirdly impotent, like weirdly confusing and weirdly sort of stupid and even childish. Well, that's because we're trying to manage something this big with things that are this big. Right? It's just like a two-year-old yeah. trying to, to sort of drive a car or, or manage a company. It's, we don't have yet the appropriate sort of distributed cognition. We have the appropriate kind of our own identity that has itself the actual minimum viable capacity to properly govern this kind of thing. So it's a non-starter, mm. right? Now we're going to switch to a slightly different language, but it's the same kind of thing. Remember, we talked about how do you change your identity from an addict? My identity is an addict. I need to change my identity. Well, the only way to do that is that I have to surrender my identity to a greater identity. Notice that these are parallel constructions. How do I govern a identity? Well, I have to I have to have a, an identity which is greater than it. So we have to find a way of surrendering our identity as agents. In many ways, by the way, we are we are largely addicted to much of the incentive landscape that entrains our choice making into a context where we find ourselves participating in chat GPT, et cetera, et cetera, whether we like it or not. Right? So it's important. There's a lot of addiction stuff going on for everybody. Right? Even even like the the engineers at OpenAI who are concerned about building you know, killer AIs, they're trapped in a game theoretic dynamic where they're, well, if we don't do it, somebody else will. So we better be the ones who do it. And of course, that, that creates a whole feedback loop. You know, Sam, I guess I have to save everybody because I'm in charge of this thing. And if I don't do it and I don't manage to make it good, then everything dies, right? which is not healthy for the psychology. Um, if we wish to find a way to change that identity to which we are participants, whether we like it or not, largely speaking, um, we need to find a way to surrender to a greater identity. All right, so this now, now a lot of these concepts are starting to collect. Uh, if you can follow the arc, you can understand why what I just said makes sense. But there's some implications that follow from it. If it does make sense, it imp it implies a wide variety of things. Yeah, I it's 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 really fascinating that you talk about. You know, when we're kind of just describing things like hyper objects, as, as Tim Morton would kind of describe these these things which you can't get a grasp on. Um, you know, as as one individual person, and I remember writing an article um, about economics, which basically argued that that if you want to navigate, or the way we navigate something like the economy, because given that it's it almost this hyper object, is through distributed cognition. Mm -hmm. Like that, like there is a way in which um, with, through uh, other other technologies and uh other niches uh like money and prices you, you could say there's almost like a a web of different hyper objects such that we navigate uh the economy 
as a thing and give it identity through also participating in uh, other or and also and, and in a and yeah things like prices they manifest to us you know what exactly is it where's the information stored in it you know no it's but it's it's but it but it's there is some point in which in which it's um, sending information across to people um so so that's 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 really fascinating um i uh <laughs> and on a not necessarily related note um when you talk about participating in a higher identity um i'll just just go for this um when one gets uh baptized which i haven't but um one in the right it's about actually you are joining the army of god um the battle has been won uh in christ mm -hmm. um the high identity has won and it's just about giving yourself to that to you could say help you know the example people give is you know in d-day when that was successful the nazis were defeated but we still had to do it yes and one still has to fight the final battles and so that was how i was hearing some of these church fathers on a, on a great podcast called lord of spirits kind of describe what participating in the higher identity of of christ actually is and it, it's 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 really great um uh <laughs> yeah that's really great um beautifully landed by the way um yeah i, I mean to be very simple i think that's, that's great right. i think yeah. That's, yeah. that's right and so notice what happens when you go through that switch this is again like being the in, in the aa example which is very nice it's a very simple example you acknowledge that you're an addict you surrender to a higher power and then you begin to behave in that actualization. Like you behave in the actualization to that, uh, in, in, of that surrender. You have to actually embody it, not just sort of say, ah, I surrender. You have to live that surrender. Same thing in the, in the context of Christ. Like if you, if you surrender to Christ and become a body of the church, it's not like a one way deal where suddenly you're sort of magically and instantaneously uh, always going to be doing the right thing all the time. You now are in the process of having to embody that surrender. You have to actually become that one. You have to uh, disciple is the term. Like you have to become a disciple to Christ. The invitation is follow me. So, okay, Alpheus, leave your job as being a money a tax collector. That's the first move, right? You've acknowledged that you're an addict and you've chosen to surrender your identity to a new identity. Follow me. Leave what you are. But now follow me. Now you're on a journey. You have to pick up your cross and carry it. Right? That's the other half of the equation. And, um, but it's a very different kind of thing because once you are on the other side, all you have to do is pick up your cross and carry it, right? You, you don't have to pick up anybody else's cross. You don't have to pick up the big old cross that Christ is carrying. You have to pick up your cross, which is a very much more, much narrower thing, right? You're actually finding yourself coordinated, right? Just like a football player in the football team. You don't have to play all the roles. You have to play one, play yours, find out what yours is, and then play it impeccably which is a beautiful thing because now what happens is that you get to fulfill your beingness. Why are you here? This is now, by the way, we're aligning a number of different pieces. When we talked about that, the Pajot Peterson thing, what we're saying is that there's something about the nature of surrendering to Christ, which is simultaneously the solution to all the things that were insolvable in the, in, in, as, as a tax collector in, in a previous identity to the addictions in the previous identity. But also, it happens to be the ultimate ultimate. It's, it's, you know, it's both the beauty, truth, and good at its highest form, which is to say that on that path of discipleship, you are now not just escaping the horrible fate that was, that was prior, but you're now actually journeying into a deeper and deeper, deeper realization of your highest possibility of who you are and all the highest possible relationships into which you can go. Right? So it's a, it's a sort of a double win invitation. It is the essence of the win-win invitation. Um, mm -hmm, yeah. I mentioned, yeah. by the way, in my experience, and I think also I would imagine your experience, certainly everybody I've spoken to, um, it's not fun necessarily. Sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's awesome. Sometimes it's super hard, right? That's, you know, and that's not even relevant ultimately, right? It's like, like I'm, I'm climbing Mount Everest. I'm mean, just what I'm doing. Well, there's a bunch of shit involved in climbing Mount Everest. Though. You're going to have to like, sh you know, schlep your stuff. And it's going to be cold, but oh, fair enough. Like you've made a choice. You're, you know, that's your new identity. All this just com comes along with it. Um, including, by the way, the fact that if you're complaining about the fact that you're schlepping your stuff, well, that's a learning opportunity and changing who you are so you can become you know, able to recognize, oh, yeah, forgot. That I'm, that's part of the deal. Do you have anything else? Thank, Thank you for this conversation. Do you have anything else you want to add and to close this off? No, no, I think that's pretty good. You no. did a good job. Though. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Awesome.